Hello, and welcome to the It's the Read You Need channel. Please like, share, and subscribe. And please leave a comment with any suggestions for future material. Heaven and Hell by Aldous Huxley Part 2 I have spoken so far only of vision-inducing materials and their psychological devaluation by modern technology. It is now time to consider the purely artistic devices by means of which vision-inducing works have been created. Light and colour tend to take on a preternatural quality when seen in the midst of an environing darkness. Fra Angelico's crucifixion at the Louvre has a black background. So have the frescoes of the Passion painted by Andrea del Castango for the nuns of Santa Apollina at Florence. Hence the visionary intensity, the strange transporting power of these extraordinary works. In an entirely different artistic and psychological context, the same device was often used by Goya in his etchings. Those flying men, that horse on a tightrope, a huge and ghastly incarnation of fear, all of them stand out as though floodlit against a background of impenetrable night. With the development of chiaroscuro in the 16th and 17th centuries, night came out of the background and it stored itself within the picture which became the scene of a kind of Manichean struggle between light and darkness. At the time they were painted, these works must have possessed a real transporting power. To us, who have seen altogether too much of this kind of thing, most of them seem merely theatrical. But a few still retain their magic. There is Caravaggio's Entombment, for example. There are a dozen magical paintings by Georges de Lantour. There are all those visionary Rembrandts, where the lights have the intensity and significance of light at the mind's antipodes, where the darks are full of rich potentialities waiting their turn to become actual, to make themselves glowingly present to our consciousness. In most cases, the ostensible subject matter of Rembrandt's pictures is taken from real life or the Bible. A boy at his lessons, or Bathsheba bathing. A woman wading in a pond, or Christ before his judges. Occasionally, however, these messages from the other world are transmitted by means of a subject trauma, not from real life or history, but from the realm of archetypal symbols. There hangs in the Louvre a Meditation de Philosophie, whose symbolical subject matter is nothing more or less than the human mind, with its teeming darkness, its moments of intellectual and visionary illumination, its mysterious stairways winding downwards and upwards into the unknown. The meditating philosopher sits there in his island of inner illumination, and at the opposite end of the symbolic chamber, in another, rosier island, an old woman couches before the hearth. The firelight touches and transfigures her face, as we see, concretely illustrated, the impossible paradox and supreme truth that perception is, or at least can be, ought to be, the same as revelation that reality shines out of every appearance, that the one is totally, infinitely present in all particulars. Along with the paternatural lights and colours, the gems and the ever-changing patterns, visitors to the mind's antipodes discover a world of sublimely beautiful landscapes, of living architecture and heroic figures. The transporting power of many works of art is attributable to the fact that their creators have painted scenes, persons and objects which remind the beholder of what, consciously or unconsciously, he knows about the other world at the back of his mind. 
let us begin with the human or, rather, the more than human inhabitants of these far-off regions. Blake called them the cherubim, and in fact that is what, no doubt, they are, the psychological originals of those beings who, in the theology of every religion, serve as the intermediaries between man and the clear light. The more than human personages of visionary experiences never do anything. Similarly, the blessed never do anything in heaven. They are content merely to exist. Under many names and attired in an endless variety of costumes, these heroic figures of man's visionary experience have appeared in the religious art of every culture. Sometimes they are shown at rest, sometimes in historical or mythological action. But action, as we have seen, does not come naturally to the inhabitants of the mind's antipodes. To be busy is the law of our being. The law of theirs is to do nothing. When we force these serene strangers to play a part in one of our all-too-human dramas, we are being false to visionary truth. That is why the most transporting though not necessarily the most beautiful, representation of the cherubim, are those which show them as they are in their native habitats, doing nothing in particular. And that accounts for the overwhelming, the more than merely aesthetic, impression made upon the beholder by the great static masterpieces of religious art. The sculptured figures of Egyptian gods and god-kings, the Madonnas and panto craters of the Byzantine mosaics, the bodhisattvas and lohans of China, the seated Buddhas of Khmer, the steels and statues of Copan, the wooded idols of tropical Africa. These have one characteristic in common, a profound stillness. And it is precisely this which gives them their numinous quality, their power to transport the beholder out of the old world of his everyday experience, far away, towards the visionary antipodes of the human psyche. There is, of course, nothing intrinsically excellent about static art. Static or dynamic, a bad piece of work is always a bad piece of work. All I mean to imply is that, other things being equal, A heroic figure at rest has a greater transporting power than one which is shown in action. The cherubim live in paradise, and the New Jerusalem, in other words, among prodigious buildings set in rich, bright gardens with distant prospects of plain and mountain, of rivers and the sea. This is a matter of immediate experience, a psychological fact which has been recorded in folklore, and the religious literature of every age and country. It has not, however, been recorded in pictorial art. Reviewing the succession of human cultures, we find that landscape painting is either non-existent, or rudimentary, or of very recent development. In Europe, a full-blown art of landscape painting has existed for only four or five centuries. In China, for not more than a thousand years, in India, for all practical purposes, never. This is a curious fact that demands an explanation. Why should landscapes have found their way into the visionary literature of a given epoch and a given culture, but not into the painting? Posed in this way, the question provides its own best answer. People may be content with the mere verbal expression of this aspect of their visionary experience, and feel no need for its translation into pictorial terms. That this often happens in the case of individuals is certain. Blake, for example, saw visionary landscapes, articulated beyond all that the mortal and perishing nature can produce, and infinitely more perfect and minutely organised than anything seen by the mortal eye. Here is the description of such a visionary landscape which Blake gave at one of Mrs. Ada's evening parties. The other evening, taking a walk, I came to a meadow 
and at the further corner of it I saw a fold of lambs. Coming nearer, the ground blushed with flowers, and the wattled coat and its woolly tenants were of an exquisite pastoral beauty. But I looked again, and it proved to be no living flock, but beautiful sculpture. Rendered in pigments, this vision would look, I suppose, like some impossibly beautiful blending of one of Constable's freshest oil sketches with an animal painting in the magically realistic style of Zubaran's hallowed lamb now in the San Diego Museum. But Blake never produced anything remotely resembling such a picture. He was content to talk and write about his landscape visions, and to concentrate on his painting upon the cherubim. What is true of an individual artist may be true of a whole school. There are plenty of things which men experience, but do not choose to express. Or they may try to express what they have experienced, but in only one of their arts. In yet other cases, they will express themselves in ways having no immediately recognisable affinity to the original experience. In this last context, Dr. A. K. Kumaraswamy has some interesting things to say about the mystical art of the Far East, the art where denotation and connotation cannot be divided and no distinction is felt between what a thing is and what it signifies. The supreme example of such mystical art is the Zen-inspired landscape painting, which arose in China during the Sung period and came to new birth in Japan four centuries later. India and the Near East have no mystical landscape painting, but they have its equivalents. Vaisnava painting, poetry and music in India, where the theme is sexual love, and Sufi poetry and music in Persia, devoted to praises of intoxication. Bed, as the Italian proverb succinctly puts it, is the poor man's opera. Analogously, sex is the Hindu's song. Wine, the Persian's impressionism. The reason being, of course, that the experiences of sexual union and intoxication partake of that essential otherness characteristic in all vision including that of landscapes. If at any time men have found satisfaction in a certain kind of activity, it is to be presumed that, at periods when this satisfying activity was not manifested, there must have been some kind of equivalent for it. In the Middle Ages, for example, men were preoccupied in an obsessive and almost mani maniacal way with words and symbols. Everything in nature was instantly recognised as the concrete illustration of some notion formulated in one of the books or legends currently regarded as sacred. And yet, at other periods of history, men have found a deep satisfaction in recognising the autonomous otherness of nature, including many aspects of human nature. The experience of this otherness was expressed in terms of art, religion or science. What were the medieval equivalents of constable and ecology, of bird-watching and Eliseus, of microscopy and the rites of Dionysus and the Japanese haiku? They, they were to be found, I suspect, in Saturnalian orgies at the end of the scale and in mystical experiences at the other. Shrovatides, May Days, Carnivals, these permitted a direct experience of the animal otherness underlying personal and social identity. Infused contemplation revealed yet another otherness of the divine not-self. And somewhere between the two extremes were the experiences of the visionaries and the vision-inducing arts, by means of which it was sought to recapture and recreate those experiences. The art of the jeweller, of the maker of stained glass, of the weaver of tapestries, of the painter, poet and musician. In spite of a natural history that was nothing but a set of drearily moralistic symbols, in the teeth of a theology which, 
instead of regarding words as the signs of things, treated things and events as the signs of biblical or Aristotelian worlds, our ancestors remained relatively sane, and they achieved this feat by periodically escaping from the stifling prison of their bumptiously rationalistic philosophy, their anthropomorphic, authoritarian and non-experimental science, their all-too-articulate religion, into non-verbal, other than human worlds inhabited by their instincts, by the visionary fauna of their minds, antipodes, and, beyond and yet within all the rest, by the indwelling spirit. From this wide-ranging but necessary digression, let us return to the particular case from which we set out. Landscapes, as we have seen, are a regular feature of the visionary experience. Descriptions of visionary landscapes occur in the ancient literatures of folklore and religion, but paintings of landscapes do not make their appearance until comparatively recent times. To what has been said, by way of explanation about psychological equivalence, I will add a few brief notes on the nature of landscape paintings a visionary art. Let us begin by asking a question. What landscapes, or more generally, what representation of natural objects, are most transporting, most intrinsically vision-inducing? In the light of my own experiences and of what I have heard of other people say about their reactions to works of art, I will risk an answer. Other things being equal, for nothing can make up for lack of talent, the most transporting landscapes are, first, those which represent natural objects a very long way off, and, second, those which represent them at close range. Distance lends enchantment to the view, but so does propinquity, a Sung painting of faraway mountains, clouds and torrents are is transporting, but so are the close-ups of tropical leaves in the Douanier Rousseau's jungles. When I look at the Sung landscape, I am reminded, or one of my not-eyes is reminded, of the crags, the boundless expanses of plain, the luminous skies and seas of the mind's antipodes and those disappearances into mist and cloud, those sudden emergences of some strange, intensely definite form, a weathered rock, for example, an ancient pine tree twisted by years of struggle with the wind, these too are transporting. For they remind me, consciously or unconsciously, of the other world's essential alienness and unaccountability. It is the same with the close-up. I look at those leaves with their architecture of veins, their stripes and mottlings, I peer into the depths of interlacing greenery, and something in me is reminded of the, those living patterns, so characteristic of the visionary world, of those endless births and proliferations of geometrical forms that turn into objects of things that are forever being transmuted into other things. This painted close-up of a jungle is what, on one of its aspects, the other world is like, and so it transports me. It makes me see with eyes that transfigure a work of art into something else, something beyond art. I remember, very vividly, though it took place many years ago, a conversation with Roger Fry. We were talking about Monet's Water Lilies, they had no right, Roger kept insisting, to be so shockingly organised, so totally without a proper compositional skeleton. They were all wrong, artistically speaking, and yet, he had to admit, and yet, and yet, as I should, say, should now say, they were transporting. An artist of, aston of outstanding virtuosity had chosen to paint a close-up of natural objects seen in their own context and without reference to merely human notions of what's what or what ought to be what. Man, we like to say, is the measure of all things. 
For Monet, on this occasion, water lilies were the measure of water lilies, and so he painted them. The same non-human point of view must be adopted by any artist who tries to render the distant scene. How tiny, in the Chinese painting, are the travellers who make their way along the valley. How frail the bamboo hut on the slope above them. And all the rest of the vast landscape is emptiness and silence. This revelation of the wilderness, living its own life according to the laws of its own being, transports the minds towards its antipodes. The primeval nature bears a strange resemblance to that inner world where no account is taken of our personal wishes, or even of the enduring concerns of man in general. Only the middle distance, and what may be called the remoter foreground, are strictly human. When we look very near or very far, man either vanishes altogether or loses his primacy. The astronomer looks even further afield than the sun painter, and sees even less of human life. At the other end of the scale, the physicist, the chemist, and physiologist pursue the close-up, the cellular close-up, the molecular, the atomic, the atomic and subatomic, of that which, at twenty feet, even at arm's length, looked and sounded like a human being, no trace remains. Something analogous happens to the myopic artist and the happy lover. In the nuptial embrace, personality is melted down. The individual, it is the recurrent theme of Lawrence's poems and novels, ceases to be himself and becomes a part of the vast impersonal universe. And so it is with the artist who chooses to use his eyes at the near point. In his work, humanity loses its importance, even disappears completely. Instead of men and women playing their fantastic tricks before high heaven, we are asked to consider the lilies, to meditate on the unearthly beauty of mere things, when isolated from their utilitarian context and rendered as they are, in and for themselves. Alternatively, or at an earlier stage of artistic development exclusively, the non-human world of the near point is rendered in patterns. These patterns are abstracted, for the most part, from leaves and flowers, the rose, the lotus, the acanthus, palm, papyrus, and are elaborated with recurrences and variations into something transportingly reminiscent of the living geometries of the other world. Freer and more realistic treatments of nature at the near point make their appearance at a relatively recent date, but far earlier than those treatments of the distant scene, to which alone, and mistakenly, we give the name of landscape painting. Rome, for example, had its close-up landscapes, the fresco of a garden, which once adorned a room in Livia's villa, is a magnificent example of this form of art. For theological reasons, Islam had to be content, for the most part, with arabesques, luxuriant and, as in visions, continually varying patterns, based upon natural objects seen at the near point. But even in Islam, the genuine close-up landscape was not unknown. Nothing can exceed in beauty and in vision-inducing power the mosaics of gardens and buildings in the great Omeyyad Mosque at Damascus. In medieval Europe, despite the prevailing mania for turning every datum into a concept, every immediate experience into a mere symbol of something in a book, realistic close-ups of foliage and flowers were fairly common. We find them carved on the capitals of Gothic pillars, as in the chapter house of Southwell Minster. We find them in paintings of the chase, paintings whose subject was that ever-present fact of medieval life, the forest, seen as the hunter or the strayed traveller sees it, in all its bewildering intricacy of leafy detail. The frescoes in the papal palace at Avignon are almost the sole survivors of what even in the time of Chaucer, 
was a widely practiced form of secular art. A century later, this art of the forest close-up came to its self-conscious perfection in such magnificent and magical works as Pisanello's St. Hubert and Paolo Ocello's Hunt in a Wood, now in the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford. Closely related to the wall paintings of forest close-ups were the tapestries, with which the rich men of, northeast, of northern Europe adorned their houses. The best of these are vision-inducing works of the highest order. In their own way, they are as heavenly, as powerfully reminiscent of what goes on at the mind's antipodes, as are the great masterpieces of landscape painting at the furthest point, sung mountains in their enormous solitude, Ming rivers interminably lovely, the blue subalpine world of Titan's distances, the England of Constable, the Italies of Turner and Corot, the Provences of Cézanne and Van Gogh, the Ile de France of Sicily, and the Ile de France of Vouliard. Vouliard, incidentally, was a supreme master of both the transporting close-up and of the transporting distant view. His bourgeois interiors are masterpieces of vision-inducing art, compared with which the works of such conscious and, so to say, professional visionaries as Blake and Odilon Redon seem feeble in the extreme. In Vouliard's interiors, every detail, however trivial, however hideous even, the pattern of the late Victorian wallpaper, the Art Nouveau Biblot, the Brussels carpet, is seen and rendered as a living jewel, and all these jewels are harmoniously combined into a whole which is a jewel of a yet higher order of visionary intensity. And when the upper middle class inhabitants of Vouliard's New Jerusalem go for a walk, they find themselves not, as they had supposed, in the department of Sende et Oz, but in the Garden of Eden, in another world, which is yet essentially the same as this world, but transfigured and therefore transporting. I have spoken so far only of the blissful visionary experience and of its interpretation in terms of theology, its translation into art. But visionary experience is not always blissful. It is sometimes terrible. There is hell as well as heaven. Like heaven, the visionary hell has a preternatural light and its preternatural significance. But the significance is intrinsically appalling, and the light is the smoky light of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the darkness visible of Milton. In the Journal d'Um Schizophrene, the autobiographical record of a young girl's passage through madness, the world of the schizophrenic is called Le Pays de Clement, the country of lit upness. It is a name which a mystic might have used to denote his heaven. But for poor Rene, the schizophrenic, the illumination is infernal, an intense electric glare without a shadow, ubiquitous and implacable. Everything that, for healthy visionaries, is a source of bliss brings to René only fear and a nightmarish sense of unreality. The summer sunshine is malignant. The gleam of polished surfaces is suggestive, not of gems, but of machinery and enamelled tin. The intensity of existence which animates every object, when seen at close range and out of its utilitarian context, is felt as a menace. And then there is the horror of infinity, for the healthy visionary, the perception of the infinite, in a finite particular, is a revelation of divine immanence. For René, it was a revelation of what she calls the system, the vast cosmic mechanism which exists only to grind out guilt and punishment, solitude and unreality. Sanity is a matter of degree and there are plenty of visionaries who see the world as René saw it, but contrive, nonetheless, to live outside the asylum. For them, as for the positive visionary, the universe is transfigured, but for the worse. 
everything in it, from the stars in the sky to the dust under their feet, is unspeakably sinister or disgusting. Every event is charged with a hateful significance. Every object manifests the presence of an indwelling horror, infinite, all-powerful, eternal. This negatively transfigured world has found its way, from time to time, into literature and the arts. It writhed and threatened in Van Gogh's later landscapes. It was the setting and the theme of all Kafka's stories. It was Gericolt's spiritual home. It was inhabited by Goya during the years of his deafness and solitude. It was glimpsed by Browning when he wrote Child Roland. It had its place over against the Theophanies in the novels of Charles Williams. The negative visionary experience is often accompanied by bodily sensations of a very special and characteristic kind. Blissful visions are generally associated with a sense of separation from the body, a feeling of de-individualization. It is, no doubt, this feeling of de-individualization which makes it possible for the Indians who practice the peyote cult to use the drug not merely as a shortcut to the visionary world, but also as an instrument for creating a loving solidarity within the participating group. When the visionary experience is terrible and the world is transfigured for the worse, individualization is an intensified, and the negative visionary finds himself associated with a body that seems to grow progressively more dense, more tightly packed, until he finds himself at last reduced to being the agonised consciousness of the inspissated lump of matter. No bigger than a stone can be held between the hands. It is worth remarking that many of the punishments described in the various accounts of hell are punishments of pressure and construction. Dante's sinners are buried in mud, shut up in trunks of trees, frozen solid in blocks of ice, crushed beneath stones. The inferno is psychologically true. Many of its pains are experienced by schizophrenics, and by those who have taken mescaline or lysergic acid under unfavourable conditions. What is the nature of these unfavourable conditions? How and why is heaven turned into hell? In certain cases, the negative visionary experience is the result of predominantly physical causes. Mescaline tends, after ingestion, to accumulate in the liver. If the liver is diseased, the associated mind may find itself in hell. But what is more important for our present purposes is the fact that negative visionary experience may be induced by purely psychological means. Fear and anger bar the way to the heavenly other world and plunge the masculine taker into hell. And what is true of the masculine taker is also true of the person who sees visions spontaneously or under hypnosis. Upon this psychological foundation has been reared the theological doctrine of saving faith, a doctrine to be met with in all the great religious traditions of the world. Eschatologists have always found it difficult to reconcile their rationality and their morality with the brute facts of psychological experience. As rationalists and moralists, they feel that good behaviour should be rewarded and that the virtuous deserve to go to heaven. But as psychologists, they know that virtue is not the sole or sufficient condition of blissful visionary experience. They know that works alone are powerless and that it is faith, or loving confidence, which guarantees that visionary experience shall be blissful. Negative emotions, the fear which is the absence of confidence, the hatred, anger or malice which exclude love, are the guarantee that visionary experience, if and when it comes, shall be appalling. The Pharisee is a virtuous man, but his virtue is of a kind which is compatible with negative emotion. His visionary experiences are therefore likely to be infernal rather than blissful.
The nature of the mind is such that the sinner who repents and makes an act of faith in a higher power is more likely to have a blissful visionary experience than is the self-satisfied pillar of society with his righteous indignations, his anxiety about possessions and pretensions, his ingrained habits of blaming, despising and condemning. Hence the enormous importance attached, in all the great religious traditions, to the state of mind at the moment of death. Visionary experience is not the same as mystical experience. Mystical experience is beyond the realm of opposites. Visionary experience is still within that realm. Heaven entails hell, and going to heaven is no more liberation than is the descent into horror. Heaven is merely a vantage point from which the divine ground can be more clearly seen than on the level of ordinary, individualised existence. If consciousness survives bodily death, it survives, presumably, on every mental level. On the level of mystical experience, on the level of blissful visionary experience, on the level of infernal visionary experience, and on the level of everyday individual existence. In life, even the blissful visionary experience tends to change its sign if it persists too long. Many schizophrenics have their times of heavenly happiness, but the fact that, unlike the masculine taker, they do not know when, if ever, they will be permitted to return to the reassuring banality of everyday experience causes even heaven to seem appalling. But for those who for whatever reason, are appalled, heaven turns into hell, bliss into horror, the clear light into the hateful glare of the land of lit-upness. Something of the same kind may happen in the posthumous state. After having had a glimpse of the unbearable splendour of ultimate reality, and after having shuttled back and forth between heaven and hell, most souls find it possible to retreat into the more reassuring region of the mind, where they can use their own and other people's wishes, memories and fancies to construct a world very like that in which they lived on earth. Of those who die an infinitesimal minority are capable of immediate union with the divine ground. A few are capable of supporting the visionary bliss of heaven, a few find themselves in the visionary horrors of hell and are unable to escape. The great majority end up in the kind of world described by Swedenborg and his mediums. From this world it is doubtless possible to pass, when the necessary conditions have been fulfilled, to worlds of visionary bliss or the final enlightenment. My own guess is that modern spiritualism and ancient tradition are both correct. There is a posthumous state of the kind described in Sir Oliver Lodge's book, Raymond. But there is also a heaven of blissful visionary experience. There is also a hell of the same kind of appalling visionary experience as is suffered here by schizophrenics and some of those who take masculine, and there is also an experience, beyond time, of union with the divine ground.